Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Foster, the Dean of Melbourne Law School, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Seabrook Chambers Public Lecture. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet tonight on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Now tonight's event forms part of the Seabrook Chambers Lecture Series, an annual lecture series established by former judges of the Accident Compensation Tribunal in the state of Victoria. The rationale for this series is to support a jurist of international repute to speak on the rule of law. Tonight's speaker certainly fits that objective. Before I introduce our guest and her lecture topic, please note that this evening is being recorded and will be made available on the Melbourne Law School website at a later date. Well, we are honoured this evening to welcome a guest speaker of the reputation and calibre of Chief Justice Deborah Mortimer. Chief Justice Mortimer was appointed Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Australia in 2023, having served as a judge on the Federal Court since 2013. She's the fifth Chief Justice of the Court since the Court's inception in 1976, and is the first female Chief Justice appointed to the Court. Prior to her elevation to the bench, her honour was a member of the Victorian Bar and distinguished herself as a barrister and senior counsel specialising in public law, anti-discrimination law, extradition and environmental law issues, to name a few. But I would like to single out in particular her contribution to my own area of academic expertise, namely refugee law. Her outstanding advocacy while at the Bar over many years made a significant contribution to developing principles of statutory construction and a robust application of Chapter 3 of the Constitution relevant to the plight of asylum seekers. Her Honour's meticulous arguments were instrumental in the High Court recognising the limits of executive power, especially in the context of immigration detention. Since her honours elevation to the federal court, she has applied her formidable forensic legal analytical skills, integrity, and her humanity to a wide range of significant legal matters, making important contributions to the rule of law in Australia. Chief Justice Mortimer also continu continues generously to nurture the next generation of legal professionals, teaching a public law and litigation subject to Melbourne Law School master's students. And then, because she obviously has too much spare time, she also serves as an advisory board member of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies at Melbourne Law School, where she's also a senior fellow. Well, this evening, as you know, Her Honour will address the topic, Reflections on the Concept of Open Justice. In this lecture, Chief Justice Mortimer will examine the origins of the concept of open justice, and will offer some views on how it might be understood and what place the concept has in the administration of justice by a court such as in the Federal Court of Australia. And following Her Honours Lecture, my colleague Professor Heather Douglas of Melbourne Law School will lead a Q&A, so there will be opportunities for questions at the conclusion of Her Honours Lecture. And now, without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome you, Justice Mortimer, Chief Justice Mortimer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for the invitation to speak this evening. And uh, I want to start by congratulating you on your appointment as Dean of this Law School. Uh, thank you all for taking the time out of your lives to come and listen tonight. Uh, it's a great honour to speak. For reasons related to uh, claims of native title in our court, um, I offer my respects to the people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and to their ancestors and elders. And I thank them for their stewardship over this country for many generations before colonisation and their determination to continue that stewardship despite colonisation. The origins of this lecture in rule of law themes led me to uh, reflect on um, how courts administer justice and that that might be a good topic to talk to tonight. Um, the problem I'm going to suggest with the word open justice in that phrase is that it's too absolute. Open justice can be used to suggest that without immediate and full disclosure of everything in a proceeding, what a court is doing is secret justice. 
and that is just not correct. Uh, it's a big topic, uh, so forgive me for galloping a little through it. There will be a written paper in due course, uh, and I'll address some of the matters in more detail in that paper. My specific focus is on how the federal court in a contemporary Australian landscape can remain faithful to the values that sit behind the phrase open justice, which, as I've said, are values that do not favour disclosure of everything and anything filed with a court or reduced in evidence. Open justice is not open slather. The chief object of the courts of justice, it's been said, is to secure that justice is done, and that requires a steady focus on what justice requires as between parties to a proceeding and more widely. It is important that courts ensure that all members of our community can experience, understand and discuss how courts go about resolving disputes brought to them. But in contemporary times, the federal court strives to achieve those objectives with a wider range of tools at its disposal than courts of the past. Whatever tools we, used, we use, we are still involved in a balancing exercise. And it's that balancing exercise I want to talk about tonight. Across Australia, a myriad of legislation at state and federal level exists to constrain and regulate how courts uh, implement open justice principles. And many of these are jurisdiction dependent. There's no one size fits all, and generalisations and sweeping statements can really be dangerous in this area. They risk unfair and uninformed criticism of courts and their judges who strive to be faithful to the individual cases and the law they are dealing with. On our court, one development uh, of recent times that I want to acknowledge is the establishment of the Federal Courts Media Committee, which is chaired by Justice Michael Wigney. Uh, that innovation um, occurred early in my time as Chief Justice, having looked with some of my colleagues, including Justice Wigney at models in other jurisdictions. This media committee comprises external media representatives, judges, registrars and court staff involved in media issues. And we see it as a consultative mechanism uh, that I hope will improve the court's ability to engage constructively in how we do our work. But when we're discussing this concept of open, open justice, we have to keep a close eye on the subject matter of litigation. The federal court doesn't operate in some jurisdictions where there is really intense scrutiny uh, to the private and personal tragedies and circumstances of litigants. And my colleagues who work in those jurisdictions are better placed to talk about the balancing acts that they have to engage in. In the practice areas of the federal court, our judges encounter the following kinds of situations. We do encounter cases where private or personal information is involved. We encounter those in fair work claims, in sexual harassment claims, in other interpersonal employment conflicts, in bankruptcy, discrimination and defamation. We encounter cases where commercially sensitive information is involved in commercial and corporations cases, in intellectual property, insolvency and regulator work. And we encounter uh, issues about open justice where claims are settled and they can be across all the court's practice areas and notoriously in class actions. I want to spend a few minutes, even though much of this is familiar to some of many of you in this audience, to um, recap on uh, how we got to the point we've reached about open justice principles. The fundamental feature of trials and exercises of judicial power that we've inherited from the United Kingdom is public attendance and therefore public scrutiny. This feature dates from a time where trials and exercises of judicial power were mostly oral in form and obviously involved physical presence, a time where power was concentrated in particular classes and only in men. What mattered then was not necessarily universal understanding and scrutiny, which might be where we're tending to head today, but scrutiny from at least a section of the public. Over time, the tradition of courts conducting hearings in public was elevated to the status of a legal principle, and the vice that was sought to be avoided was secrecy. 
Scrutiny was believed to build confidence in a system of justice. It's been said that conducting trials where the public could attend was believed to encourage witnesses to give truthful evidence, to complete the court record, to promote the proper exercise of judicial authority. And at least in the last two centuries, courts conducting their work in public is said to have contributed to an understanding of how the legal system worked. We might question that and to provide a tangible demonstration of judicial independence and to increase public confidence and trust. These are the familiar themes that you read in all the literature work, uh, written about open justice. But in my view, in contemporary Australia, these critical values will come from a much wider range of approaches by courts than just resorting to an incantation of the principle of open justice. In some research um, that was done for this paper, it's, uh, what we were able to find was that that term open justice, instead of open courts, which, which was the earlier term that was used, um, seems to have emerged in, a, in perhaps the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, we found a case um, in our court, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and Parish, a case about cricket, where the ABC brought proceedings against a number of respondents in relation to the arrangement for tours of international cricket teams to Australia, which it contended was affecting its broadcasting opportunities, and it wanted to see the agreement about these arrangements produced in court. Um, the trial judge in that matter was Justice Brennan, and His Honour declined to grant a suppression order over the commercial agreement, and explained his reasons for that, which I'll set out in the written paper. Um, his Honour's refusal of a suppression order was overturned by a majority of the full court, which just goes to show you that even the best judges get rolled from time to time. I take some comfort in that. Uh, Justice Dean dissented and placed similar emphasis to Justice Brennan on open justice. But by this time, around 1980, in our court, um, the practice of judges doing their work in a public environment was well entrenched. Across the country, our court came to be located in modern buildings, and thanks to uh, former Chief Justice Michael Black, buildings that deliberately emphasised accessibility, light and openness. But as the Parish decision illustrates, right from the start in Section 50 of the Federal Court Act, Parliament was an aware of the need to balance access and publication of evidence and documents with appropriate protections from disclosure. And the kinds of matters that our court started to exercise jurisdiction over, trade practices, intellectual property, corporations law, invariably meant that parties were applying for orders that precluded some evidence or information being disclosed. But times have moved on, and in contemporary Australian courts, the media is just one conduit to the community we serve, albeit an important one. These days, the, court has, the community has much greater access to the work of the courts, and we must pay attention to more direct engagement with the community to help them better understand our work and the range of ways we can make the courts work more accessible to our community. So I suggest that accessible justice is a more fitting term than open justice. Accessible justice in the federal court includes practices such as using concise statements instead of complicated pleadings, creating online files, developing accessible and digestible judgment summaries, live streaming trials and appeals, using remote technology where appropriate to conduct hearings, engaging on social media, providing easy access to our website, to our remote hearings, to our live stream and to our online files. It includes practices such as the digitisation of court files and community engagement by judges and registrars. I suggest that accessible justice is the concept that applies to the new modern information landscape about the justice system. 
However, in the spirit of accountability, let me spend a little time on suppression orders and non-party inspection of documents, which are two areas where our court has endured some recent scrutiny and criticism. Indeed, I opened The Age this morning, digitally, uh, to see a report on an interim suppression order made in bankruptcy proceedings by a federal court registrar in Sydney uh, before an application was referred to one of our judges. And it was the suppression order rather than the underlying controversy between the parties, which was the focus of that article. In addressing these, these matters, can I just um, remind you of a couple of basic um, attributes that we operate under. Firstly, we obviously operate in an adversarial system. So the overwhelming majority of suppression orders are made because one party applies for them. It's not a self-initiated inquiry by the court. Secondly, the federal court, like many courts, has a statutory framework in which it must operate uh, in considering suppression orders. For us, that's found in section 37 AE, AF and AG of the Federal Court of Australia Act. We are limited by a number of other provisions and different statutes, like the provisions in the Migration Act that require um, uh, the court not to publish names of applicants for protection visas. Uh, so there are a variety of statutory sources that constrain what we can do. We are also uh, always conscious of the evidentiary privileges that might restrict information that can be adduced legal professional privilege, public interest immunity, journalist privilege. So some of the restrictions of the disclosure of information are there to serve public interests in which the media has a vital um, concern. Community curiosity reflected perhaps in the desire of the media to report on details of a case uh, has never prevailed in an absolute sense. Media and community aspirations to obtain all the juicy details have never operated as some kind of open slather on the disclosure of court proceedings. Carefully and methodically over time, the common law and parliament have built up a body of law that seeks to strike a balance between, on the one hand, being faithful to the general principle that courts do their work in public, and on the other hand, being faithful to what is fair to litigants, witnesses and wider third party interests in terms of disclosure and being faithful to what facilitates doing justice between the parties who come to us. Most of us who speak or write about open justice are generally either official participants in the justice system or observers of it. It's not our story of intimate physical violations or our story of our precious mental health or our gambling addiction which led to our bankruptcy or our own contractual arrangements designed to save the business which are at stake. We have no skin in the game and yet it's us who talk about it all the time. One side of the debate does mean that objectivity is central but as in so many other areas of the law, we must never forget in this area that the law operates on the lives of human beings and in every juicy item where it might be said that this creature open justice demands disclosure, there is a human being who is personally being affected by the, court, by the decisions that the courts make. Now there are some aspects of section uh, 37 um, a, E, A, F and A, G, which I'll address, I think, in the written paper um, because I really don't have time to go through them before uh, 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 tonight. Um, but one thing I do want to emphasise is that the threshold is high in these provisions and a court is required to be satisfied that an order suppressing information is necessary. Um, 
there's an imperative and a sense of urgency or acuteness about using a word like necessary. The length of time for suppression must also be identified as necessary. And the length of, of time that suppression orders operate for is an overlooked aspect of where that word has a lot of work to do. Some suppression orders operate for a very short period of time, but that is seldom reported. The other hallmark of open justice that it's important to understand when we're looking at suppression orders is that courts must give reasons for them. So one of the other integral parts of open justice, the giving of reasons, is always there to be scrutinised when courts make suppression orders. In advance of this lecture, I asked for some preliminary research to be undertaken about the suppression orders that have been made in our court in the last financial year. And we've done that by looking at um, reasons for judgment. Uh, so I'm not suggesting it's an entirely complete picture, but I wanted to give you some idea of the proportions in our court in the last financial year. Um, our court published 1,830 judgments in the last financial year, and a suppression order was recorded as being made in 91 of those judgments, about 5%. More than half of the suppression orders related to the court's large commercial and corporations practice area, and about 10% of judgments with suppression orders related to class action proceedings. In 84 of the 91 judgments, orders were made solely on the ground that an order was necessary to prevent prejudice to the proper administration of justice. Now, these figures don't, of course, capture situations where suppression orders were refused um, and that's another um, component that it's important to remember uh, when we're looking at reporting about the making of suppression orders. The refusal of suppression orders is perhaps not always quite so loudly reported. What I learned in this exercise and looking at the numbers in our court is that it's really difficult to get an accurate picture of all the circumstances in which suppression orders are made. It's hard to capture the time limits imposed, uh, and uh, an example like the one that was in the paper this morning uh, shows us that you might get an interim order made until a matter can get before a judge, and that might not really have much of a tangible effect at all on the underlying values of operating in public, um, but yet it might be reported as a, a sort of a derogation from open justice, when what it is really doing is preserving the entitlement of those who are applying for the suppression order to make that application effective. Together with the court's records management and IT teams, I'm keen to look at a way that we can more comprehensively capture the data about suppression orders and share them internally and externally. Judges and registrars of our court have nothing to hide with this, but it's a difficult task to capture data accurately about how often these orders are made. I'm keen also to explore with my judicial colleagues and registrars whether there are other reforms the court can evaluate in terms of a notification system for suppression order applications and better ensuring that there is a proper contradictor in such applications. Uh, as Chief Justice, I completely accept that there needs to be a proper contradictor in many of these applications. So we have to make sure we're doing the best we can to ensure that can occur. Access to court records by non-parties, that's the second issue that um, our courts featured in the papers about recently. Um, Non-parties is a broad term. It goes well beyond members of the media. It might simply be a curious member of the community. It might be somebody who thinks they've got a claim of a similar kind. It might be another lawyer. It might be a member of the academy. Whatever the reason, the court's processes must work fairly and effectively for all the different categories of non-parties who want to access our court files. 
Now, prior to early 2023, the federal court's rules had one of the most permissive non-party access regimes of any court. In Rule 2.32, there was a list of unrestricted documents which non-parties could access as of right, provided they paid the prescribed fee, and that included the originating application, statements of claim, interlocutory applications. But in early 2023, the court changed its approach. The change was, made, was to make these documents not available for inspection as of right, until after the first directions hearing or a hearing, whichever is the earlier. The amendments preserve the ability of non-parties to apply for leave to inspect these documents at any point, for example, shortly after a proceeding had been filed, but an application process was imposed, whereas before there was an entitlement to access. And that change came about after the decision of our court in Porter and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation features rather regularly so far, doesn't it? Uh, in that decision, a single judge of our court dealt with an agreed proposal by the parties who had settled Mr P Christian Porter's defamation uh, claim against the ABC uh, to remove the ABC's defence from the court file. Now, Mr Porter had applied to strike out that defence on the basis that it was scandalous because of the allegations it contained. But the parties settled the proceeding before that strikeout application was heard. And part of their bargain was that the defence would be removed from the file, which the court accepted was tantamount to a suppression order. Uh, and that... Um, that was opposed by the media parties and the matter was dealt with in open court. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the written paper too. The court, um, although the court was dealing, uh, the court decided that the defence should be removed, uh, but the court also made some observations about what was seen to be the unfairness in the federal court's existing rules about document inspection. And after those observations were published, our court commenced a process of considering whether the rules should be changed. Um, part of that was an internal process, I won't say any more about that, but the court published a practice note that explained the changes. And that practice note reiterated the importance of open justice, but then it said this, it's contrary to the administration of justice for respondents to learn of the case made against them, whether through the media or other publication, before they are served or before they have a reasonable opportunity to, project the, to protect their legitimate interests by seeking properly founded suppression or non-publication orders. Um, it said a bit more than that, but that's the key message that the practice note gave. It's fair to say that from the perspective of the media, this change has introduced complexities and delays in obtaining leave to inspect documents prior to the first directions hearing. A first directions hearing may occur, or in fact, it may not occur because the parties uh, agree case management orders and an actual hearing may be a long time away. So that means the leave provisions now have a lot to do and that is a change from the very permissive regime that used to be in place. Through the media committee, the federal court has, given specific, has been given specific examples to back up these media concerns but also from the court's perspective, there have been considerable additional administrative bur burdens that have arisen from this rule, especially around how the leave process should operate and whether leave requests should always be escalated to judges. Frustration on both sides, one might say. Being faithful as a court to the conduct of our work in public and exposing ourselves to scrutiny and explaining why we make the decisions we do, all of that is our fundamental work. None of those values are substantially affected by the time at which non-parties non -parties are able to inspect court documents. 
especially in the early stages of a proceeding. The imperatives for immediate or early inspection, especially by the media, may have less to do with assisting the community to understand proceedings filed in court and more to do with the race to file news copy. Now, while we can be sympathetic to that need, the race is not and must never become the business of the courts. Filed document access comes to non-parties in what is, in the world of court proceedings, a relatively short period of time. And it now generally comes after a respondent or defendant has appeared on the record or has been given a reasonable chance to do so and the court is actively managing a case. That is the appropriate time for the court to be concerned that the community is able to follow how a proceeding is being managed and dealt with and follow what the issues are. This is the time where there might be concise statements, where there might be online files, where there might be live streaming and other accessibility initiatives that I'm going to just say a little bit more about. So the media committee in our court's been discussing how we can improve this situation because we do accept the frustration that the rule change has caused, uh, but the court wishes to remain faithful to the position it took last year. So what we're focusing on is a discussion with the media committee and then internally about ensuring a more predictable, accountable and streamlined leave process. Um, it's important in our view that we continue to be faithful to considerations of the position of respondents or defendants in proceedings in our court and ensure that they do have an entitlement to attempt to persuade the court about why there should be some limits on disclosure of originating process or statements of claim and that has to be an effective entitlement. That is just as important as allowing non-party access. But how those court processes work, how our leave processes work, I readily accept there's room for improvement in that area and that's what the court is committed to doing. I want to turn now in just a few minutes um, before we go to questions to talk about um, what I think are the broader issues of accessible justice uh, that our court intends to work with in the years to come. Uh, Approaches like uh, the court's innovations in digital case management and electronic filing, which we've been working on for more than a decade now, uh, are critical to how we can make our court more accessible. There's been an increase in trials and appeals that are being run entirely in digital form, and this focus on a digital platform for all court users uh, improves our ability to disseminate information. It particularly enables the court to produce publicly available online files. Online files are an important component of our court's work. They are established where the court expects there to be considerable community interest. And they enable direct and immediate access to filed court documents, such as pleadings, affidavits, and expert reports with no inspection processes required and no intermediaries. At the moment, Justice O'Callaghan, some of you might have read, is running the defamation trial here in Melbourne brought by Ms Moira Deeming against Mr John Pesuto. If you go onto the landing page of the Federal Court website, you can see a notification that the online file's been updated and you can click through to a wealth of evidence orders, submissions and pleadings. People who are interested can read the evidence directly for themselves and they can see directly for themselves how parties are making their arguments. This trial is also being live streamed. When I checked in on Tuesday, there were 1,300 people watching that live stream. Online files make the media's reporting job a lot easier and quicker 
They encourage access and fairness by providing source documents and enable members of the community to compare the evidence and the reporting. Where non-disclosure or suppression orders have been made, documents can still be redacted and uploaded in a redacted form. I really hope they will continue to become an increasingly used tool in accessible justice in our court. And uh, I think our judges ought to do whatever they can to encourage practitioners and parties in our court to embrace their use. Accessibility has also been enhanced by live streaming um, on the court's YouTube channel. Not sure if 50 years ago you could ever have thought that somebody would be standing up here talking about the federal court having a YouTube channel. There are prohibitions on recording of live stream proceedings um, and those prohibitions might uh, in due course provide some challenges in terms of enforcing them. But it's those prohibitions and other policy reasons that mean that live stream proceedings are generally not stored or available after the day they're streamed. However, recently I've asked that the court's YouTube channel be updated to ensure that all welcomes and farewells of judges do remain available. Um, somehow that hadn't been happening. Thank you, Justinian. There are important ceremonial events in the life of the court that happen through welcomes and farewells, and they also provide easily accessible information about our judges. Uh, we also have on that channel a wide variety of seminars, speeches, and in-conversation events, again, enabling a much wider public reach for the work of our court. This is a national court, and we must take care to conduct our work in a way that appropriately reflects this feature and the physical geography of our country and doesn't assume that everybody's able to come into the CBD to attend an event. In 2023-2024, 89 listings were live streamed, including cases familiar to you all, Robert Smith, Lehrman, and the eSafety Commissioner and ExCorp. Live streaming is often used in class action proceedings, including at case management level, to enable access by all group members to what's occurring in the proceeding. Native title case management is another area where live streaming or remote hearing technology can be used to ensure that First Nations communities whose native title claims are being dealt with by our court can stay in touch with the proceedings no matter where they are. This technology should not be underestimated as a means of keeping remote and often very disadvantaged communities in closer touch with a part of the justice system that is the part of the justice system that can be transformational for First Nations communities. Accessible justice also means using contemporary forms of communication. So apart from the YouTube channel, our court also has accounts with X, formerly Twitter, and LinkedIn, and we actively use those accounts uh, to notify the profession, litigants, and the public about a variety of things that are going on in our court. We also encourage the use of concise statements and concise responses rather than pleadings. The ACCC, a frequent litigator in our court, has been exemplary in engaging with the use of concise statements. So has ASIC and other federal agencies. But they're used now by individuals, corporations, NGOs, a wide variety of litigants. And the court's practice note encourages the use of those documents. They're, those statements are limited to five pages and must focus on the real issues in dispute between the parties and five pages still provides a substantial challenge to many lawyers, I can assure you. At the other end of the proceeding, judgment summaries are becoming a regular tool employed by the court to explain what a case was about, why a decision was made. Um, the complexity of our court's jurisdiction, both in terms of fact and law, and its very dense statutory base, mean that our substantial judgments are often not easily described as accessible, um, despite the fact that we are all conscious about trying to write less, not more. 
but judgment summaries are an increasingly helpful tool in building community understanding of our decisions and again they assist the media in fair, accurate and balanced reporting. There's always more to do and there's certainly more planned to ensure we remain faithful in our court to the proposition that justice must be accessible so that our work can be better understood in a contemporary society. Judges on our court are actively and enthusiastically engaged in a number of projects which we hope will further those objectives and technology and modern communications are key in that process. I'm proud to lead a court of intellectually committed and experienced judges and registrars who care about the work they do. They well understand the challenges and balancing required to operate in a transparent and accessible way within an adversarial system that exists impartially to resolve disputes between the parties and assist parties to resolve their disputes. No one in our court advocates secret justice. But we do believe in fair justice and in a judicial system that recognises the tensions and challenges at a case-by-case -case level and a justice system um, level as well in ensuring fairness and avoiding harm. Accessibility to our work, in my view, will come in our contemporary court from a wide, wide range of sources using a wide range of tools but the legal profession and the community should be confident of our court's commitment to those values. Thank you. Thanks so much for your wise words. Um, it's my job here to not say thank you at this point, but to open it up for questions. So, has anybody got any questions they'd like to start us off with? Yes, please. There's, do you want to um, over there? I was a little surprised that, uh, to, to focus on the. I mean, who cares if the newspaper? Oh, sorry. Who cares if the newspapers um, are whining because they haven't got uh, gossip for today? It may just be me, but when I watch. Uh, the federal court on YouTube or read through the online files, I'm, I've got way more information than I need to make a considered decision about how justice is travelling in this country. Um, could the Chief Justice talk a little bit about that? Like, what should be people who are genuinely concerned about improvements in the way people get along, resolve conflict, uh, um, deal with information um, that is coming out of the courts. And just a, a second question, if that's okay. Um, when I, there are misrepresentations, as far as I can see, <clears throat> made by journalists in the Australian about federal court judgments, and I'd like to comment on them, and I never can. Why not? Okay, two <laughs> questions there. Are you happy to? I'm not. The second one might be a bit tricky, but I'm not sure that the second question is one for me. But I, there might be other people you can pose that to. But the, your first comment is my point. My point is that in a, a contemporary court that works hard at keeping up with its technology and disseminating what it does in a variety of formats. We have so many more opportunities to engage directly with members of the community and I hope provide the media with better information for fair and accurate reporting, but also, as you say, provide the community with an opportunity to evaluate the way that matters are being reported and to, think, to reflect on that as well. So um, I'm pleased that you're accessing those resources that I've been talking about. They are intended to be there for everyone in our community throughout our country, way outside the cities, in remote and regional Australia, um, anybody that has an internet. Now, there's another challenge, of course. Thanks. Did you have a question, Nick, the person next to you? Thanks. 
Yeah, so uh, I'm not really a law student. I'm just here because my dad wanted me to come here. Um, so my knowledge of law is about extending to the road rules. So, um, but for someone like me, or maybe someone who doesn't uh, uh, speak English as well as um, a lot of Australians, or doesn't understand a lot of the law jargon, um, you know, presented in a lot of these uh, cases and a lot of the uh, reports, uh, um, what is uh, you know open justice or accessibility justice? Uh, doing to provide uh, information to these kinds of people who, you know, don't really uh, know what uh, what's happening. It's a good question. So that's I talked about judgment summaries. So one of the things you'll see, one of the things that's notorious, unfortunately, about judgments in our court is they can be really long and really complicated and difficult to follow, difficult for other judges to read, difficult for legal practitioners to read. So judgment summaries that come at the start of a case and tell, are intended to be read by people who are non-lawyers and are intended to be able to explain in a page or two what this case is about, what the court decided and why it decided it. And again, the more we can use those kinds of mechanisms the more we're going to help people understand the work that we do. So um, uh, at the moment, there's no, judges are not forced to use them. So this is an important part of judicial awareness and judi judicial education that we encourage judges to think about uh, how accessible their reasons are to the communities that they are serving. Thanks. It's over here. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. So we've been following the Pesuto and um, that trial in one of our classes. Um, and we were wondering why it is that. So I, I'm from India, where um, our courts are trying to digitize a lot of our files, but we don't have this kind of access in real time yet. So it was quite mind blowing to me that the federal court website looked like that. But I was wondering why it is that these videos get taken, the live stream gets taken down at the end of the day of the hearing. Um, because it, I, I'd assume it would be useful for anyone who's interested to be able to tune in even later. Um, and the second question I wanted to ask you is, again, because mine is a judicial system that deals with a lot of pendency, um, I was wondering whether some of the principles and solutions you've been talking about are replicable, perhaps in a trial court here, where the caseload would be more and maybe resources might be less. Um, so is this, can open justice in this way only happen in um, the higher judiciary or can the subordinate judiciary? Again, both both good questions. So uh, yes, the um, the resources that are needed to run uh, proceedings in an entirely digitised form are considerable, especially what, when you're setting when you're setting things up. So we are our court is in a very fortunate position in that sense. But it must be said uh, that my predecessors, particularly my immediate predecessor, James Alsop, I mean, there was a lot of work committed to this. So the digitisation um, process was a priority for our court. And, uh, and our courts worked really hard to make that a priority. But you're quite right that there are many courts and tribunals around the country that do not have the resources to digitise their files. Um, that's a question for funding bodies, right? Um, to go back to your first question, why, why are the live stream um, recordings not preserved? Well, there are probably a number of reasons for that, one of which is it's not just you that can watch them, but it's a whole lot of people who might be giving evidence the next day or um, uh, it, people involved in the case might be going back and trying to... Uh, comb over those recordings. If they remain available, then the prohibition on secondary recordings becomes much harder to enforce and maintain. Um, there are probably a number of other reasons, but uh, it, it's an in the moment, if you think about it as an in the moment exercise designed to replicate people being in court that's what it's designed to do, 
just as you can't really you can't go into court with a video recorder and and record it um, that's what live streaming is about live streaming is designed to replicate you being able to go into court sit there and watch a trial It's still controversial, and again, it's a matter for individual judges. Uh, particular at trial level, I would say in our court, it's still a controversial um, decision, in the sense that there are a variety of views about it. Uh, but um, at appeal level, it's much less. Um, it's much less controversial. Other questions? Uh, yes, over here. There's a microphone coming out. <clears throat> Thank you. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was excellent to hear about the steps that the court's taking to sort of implement this idea of accessible justice. You had touched on very briefly another step that the court is taking, which we referred to as um, community engagement by judges. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I wouldn't want to um, uh, say that's got as large as I'd like it to be. Um, uh, Traditionally, judges are really good at going to talk, uh, go, talking to lawyers and, and to the legal profession uh, and to the academy. We're really good at that. Uh, we're less good at exposing ourselves, I think, to the general community. Um, but we are, we are starting to do that, uh, including with our registrars, uh, when we're in locations where there might be an opportunity to have um, events that the public can attend. So our court conducts, for example, a number of in-conversation events um, which are open to the general community. We try and do that with people who are interesting uh, and might say controversial things. I did one re uh, recently with Justice Joe Williams, uh, the only Maori judge on the Supreme Court of New Zealand. Uh, Joe is highly capable of being controversial and he was. Um, so those are opportunities for the community to come along and ask questions uh, and those are the sorts of things that I think that was live streamed. Again, an example of where if people are in places where they can't get into the CBD and can't get into the court, they can still participate and understand. And those are the sorts of things we should be doing more often. And as a national court, we should be doing that in rural areas and we should be doing it in remote areas. We've probably got time for one or two more questions. So one here and then one further back and then I think we'll probably have to end. A very quick one. What's your impressions on how AI could be used in, uh, to either uh, interpret or uh, uh, misinformation? That's a topic that's being discussed um, uh, by the judiciary in all sorts of places at the moment. Um, I think there are several... You, you can, you, you've got to divide that topic of AI into several categories. There's um, the, the use of it in the conduct of legal proceedings, uh, and that's probably something that's ripe for guidelines, and some courts have introduced guidelines about that. Um, there's then a separate issue about how you use it or should you use it in decision making uh, and certainly in a court like ours, uh, there's no real active debate about using AI for judicial decision making. But there is active debate about how we should be approaching the use of AI by parties and practitioners in our court. And that's, that's one of the projects that our court's got underway at the moment. And there's just one more question, a couple of those back. Yeah, my, my question's about um, confidentiality instruments um, and even such instruments that are signed that then the people aren't allowed to even say that they've signed an instrument. Um, that, you know, does that impact open justice in, in, in sort of limiting the information that gets to the court, let alone to the public? Uh, well, it can, but th that's why what I've tried to emphasise and what I said tonight uh, is that you have to look at each individual situation 
and and you, then you have to balance what are the interests at stake so that when you're dealing, for, for example, with proceedings that settle and perhaps settle early, then there's a, a public interest and there's a justice interest in encouraging that. And sometimes confidentiality is an important part of that settlement process and people won't settle if there isn't confidentiality attached. So when judges are looking at what they should uh, make suppression orders over or non-disclosure um, orders over, they have to think about that. But then there are other things, other examples, where parties want to keep something confidential, but when it's looked at objectively through the lenses that the courts have to look at it through, there's not enough justification for that. I mean, a recent example that... I, well, an example I dealt with not that recently, a couple of years ago, was the settlement of the Dondale class action proceeding in the Northern Territory, the imprisonment of miners in Dondale. Um, the, the agreement between the Northern Territory government uh, and the applicants in that case uh, preserved the entitlement of the Northern Territory government to apply for a suppression order over the settlement sum. So the parties didn't agree to keep the settlement sum confidential, but they agreed to keep the Northern Territory's right to apply for a suppression order uh, to preserve that. So that application came to me and I didn't suppress the settlement sum. And so the settlements, that, that uh, application was unsuccessful. It's very fact specific and it won't always be the case that because the parties want something kept confidential, it gets co kept confidential. Um. Thanks, everybody, um, for your questions. It would be at this moment usually that I would give you a lovely gift, uh, but I'm told that the gift was actually stolen at some point between <laughs> setting up the event and your arrival. So we will address that at a later date. But for now... Uh, that's a first. Yes, exactly. That's why I thought I had to tell that story. It's a first for us as well. Uh, so we don't know where that exactly happened, but uh, I'm sorry to say that to you. We will, we will deal with this at a later time, I promise. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your wise words with us. As I said, it's been wonderful to hear from you. Uh, you've raised so many interesting questions. I had a few that perhaps I can ask you later. Um, but thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Justice Deborah Mortimer, for spending your time with us. Thanks tonight. for listening. Thanks.